comprehensive peace agreement. Provides for a referendum, of course, on South Sudan's future. All who have followed Sudan's post independence history, with so much loss of innocent lives and suffering, must hope that the vote beginning in two days will go peacefully. President Al Bashir is to be complimented, I must say that's the first time I've done that, for promising in Juba this week that he will respect the referendum regardless of the result and help build a brotherly nation if Southerners vote for independence. All friends of Sudan anywhere on, on the, in the world can only hope that he will carry through with this unexpected commitment. It is, however, deeply troubling that the violence in Darfur, Sudan, Ottawa, <laughs> is worsening in the run-up to the voting in the South. The major hazards of the vote in the South were set out by one of the New York Times' most discerning writers, Nicholas Kristof, on September 29th, 2010. Let me refer only to some of his, his uh, possible scenarios after the vote are counted. Uh, this is, this is Christo. Bashir might denounce the vote, saying it was illegal, tainted by violence and fraud, and invalid because the turnout fell below the 60% threshold required. Quote, tribal militias from the north later sweep through South Sudan villages, killing and raping inhabitants and driving them south. Sudan's president dispatches armed forces to seize the oil wells in the south. Christoph went on, quote, With hundreds of thousands of people fleeing the attacks, South Sudan collapses into chaos. How can these people think they can run a country, asked Mr. Bashir. He calls for, quote, peaceful negotiation with our brothers to resolve these problems and restore unity. Warfare ripples through the Nuba Mountains and then Darfur as well. Militias now cover up massacres by hiding bodies. Kristoff, quote, I fear we're on a track towards Sudan becoming the world's bloodiest war in 2011. The Obama administration is belatedly now heavily engaged in Sudan. The carrots being offered to Khartoum by Mr. Obama are juicy and smart, but there's a fatal flaw. I see no evidence of serious sticks. Put yourself in President Bashir's shoes may still be in his interest to plan a genocide, genocidal strategy in the coming months, if that will enable him to keep the oil. Even privately, we haven't laid out strong enough in disincentives. I'll skip part of it and I'll go down to Eric Reeves. I'm sure you all know that Eric Reeves, another American from Smith College, who, although uh, gravely ill, appears to have devoted virtually every waking hour of his life to Sudan for several years, including writing a book on, uh, on Darfur. Writing, he wrote on December 21st, appears a piece fearing the worst, from which I'll attempt only to give the essence, the brief essence. Quote, to be sure, dishonesty and equivocation have a long history in Western diplomatic engagement with Khartoum's National Congress Party, but under the tenure of the Special Envoy Gatillon, with unfortunate assistance from the Obama Administration, State Department, and National Security Council, as well as UN officials, the refusal to speak the truth has become habitual and may yet lead to disaster. Uh, I'll skip part of it uh, here. This is important to us as Canadians, and I'm quoting Reeves here. Quote, here perhaps the advocacy committee should recall the words of Romeo Dallaire, UN Force Commander in Rwanda during the genocide published year, several years ago, but precisely relevant in the present moment. Quote, he's quoting Dallaire. If there's any useful lesson that would be drawn from the events of April 1994, it is surely one about how personal genocide is for those who are killed, of course, but for those who kill and for those, however far away, who just do nothing. Our governments are no better than we are. The United Nations is no better than its governments. That's a quote from the International Herald Tribune on April 2005. Friends of Sudan and Canada, of which I assume most of us here today are, are supporters, September 19, 2010, an open letter to all our members of Parliament drafted by the Friends of Sudan Canada said in part, I quote, We recommend that the Prime Minister urge in the strongest possible terms that internally displaced IDPs, Southern Sudanese living in the North, be repatriated with the assistance of the UNHCR and other agencies, and that the Sudan Referendum Commission recognize the voting, voting rights of the Sudanese refugee diaspora, dual citizens, living in Canada and the U.S. by opening outside country vote centers in major cities. In fact, I read in the paper today that something like 12,000 people 
a day of it coming to the south from the north uh, without incident. Is that, is that true? Uh, finally, quoting Reeves, there's much more to be done to ensure the continuance of peace in Sudan, but given the urgency of the referendum situation, we believe that common action by MPs would be an excellent first step. Therefore, there's urgency for a special envoy to represent Canada in uh, Sudan in the referendum. We look forward to hearing your voice in the House on this subject. Uh, finally, and in conclusion, with the South Sudanese highly likely to vote for independence. Canada and other nations should be positioning ourselves for a major crisis now, and we all hope that that does not happen. Canadian taxpayers have sent about $800 million to Sudan since 2006 alone. The presence of our embassy staff, a $7 million contribution to the UN fund to support referendum activities, and about $2 million to Jimmy Carter's election monitoring center, seem to me terribly insufficient for the upcoming weeks. You probably all know that the results will be announced not until uh, about three weeks from now, I think it's February 14th. So those, those weeks are going to be terribly, terribly important. Since 2005, Canada has also deployed more than 400 soldiers and civilian peacekeepers to disarm rebel forces, train local police, and help implement the Peace Agreement. It will unfortunately be necessary for friendly governments conflict arise over oil in the south. I'm sorry you all had to stand in the cold and listen to that, but that's, uh, that's the end of my comments. And let us all hope, hope that things go peacefully in the weeks to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.